Hey everybody, welcome to Pastor Levi's class here, uh, Sunday School class. This morning we're going to go into Acts chapter 20. And as we get into it, I do want you to uh, remember where we've been. We'll do a little bit of review. Now, I do miss seeing you guys, uh, miss being uh, in Sunday School class together. Remember each day that goes on, we're one day closer uh, to being free again. So while our freedoms are currently limited uh, by the the decisions of our government in response to this virus, uh, we will be uh, praying and hoping and hopefully working towards uh, meeting together uh, someday soon. Until then, let's go ahead and look at the text. Uh, there's not, I mean, there's some fairly important things going on here in chapter 20, uh, but there's it's not as in-depth as some of the other chapters we've been uh, we've dealt with so far. So hopefully this video will go, go quicker. Famous last words, I know. Uh, so here we go. So here with the review, uh, this is, uh, as we've said, this is Paul's third missionary journey. He's been traveling around for a while now. Um, he started visiting the churches in Galatia, Macedonia, that area. And he's now arriving back in Ephesus. All right, so we remember at the end of his second journey, he had a very brief stay in Ephesus, and they asked that he would stay with them even longer. They, he asked that, hey, will you please um, continue to teach here? And Paul said, no, I need I need to get to Jerusalem, and I need to get to Antioch. So he, he departs uh, from there. But now on his third journey, he spends an extended uh, period of time uh, back in Ephesus. And he encounters at the beginning of his stay there some, uh, some of the disciples of John the Baptist, who are looking forward to the coming of the Messiah because that's what John the Baptist taught, but they didn't know Jesus and they didn't know the Spirit. So as Paul interacts with them, it becomes quite clear that they're not actually Christians at this point. Uh, so he tells them about Christ. They repent, they believe, and they receive uh, the Holy Spirit. And this highlights again what we've talked about throughout this book, that this is a book of transition. We move from one uh, the Old Covenant, we moved from that to the New Covenant. We moved into new realities uh, through the work of Christ. Uh, then Paul then teaches to the Jews and the Gentiles in Ephesus. Uh, it says three months worth of teaching in the synagogues before everything goes sour there. But then he hire, or he rents out a public hall in which he teaches to the Gentiles. And through this, Paul really does reach the entire area uh, around the, uh, the major city of Ephesus. So he's preaching and teaching there for about three years. He certainly probably does some journeys here and there in, in the in-between, in the interim. Uh, but that is that is how he spends the majority of his time. Uh, and at the right as he's about ready to leave Ephesus, and he's making plans, sending out people in front of him, there is a, a um, riot. Uh, Demetrius and the silversmiths are upset because there's been so many conversions and even public burnings of pagan uh, magical books, which were very expensive that they see a disruption here, not only to their economy, but also to their local religion, where they worshipped Artemis at their temple. The Artemis of or the Temple of Artemis was one of the seven uh, ancient wonders of the world. It was four times bigger than the Parthenon in Athens. It was just huge and magnificent, uh, and there was no small amount of money made through that. So uh, there's economic threats of what they're teaching, and there's also uh, threats here to what is going on uh, religiously and also civically because Artemis and Ephesus are kind of linked together. She is the symbol, as it were, of their of their worship or of their town pride. So that's what's going on, what we've been at so far. We're going to pick up here the story in Ephesus. So here's that map again of the of the third missionary journey. You'll see Ephesus there in about the middle of that map. He spends a lot of time there and then uh, not so much time is dedicated in Acts to some of these other stops. We just know that he, he stopped there. We don't know really uh, many other details about um, Midi Lane and Assos and Troas. We get a little bit more uh, information. But we do know that he stops at all of these towns uh, for a little bit, planting churches, encouraging the churches that are there. So let's go ahead and, and jump back in. Now Paul will depart uh, to Ephesus, or departs Ephesus in Acts chapter 20. And uh, verses 1 through 16, because of the way we've been doing uh, these online classes, uh, we are, uh, I'm kind of trying to minimize the slides here because we're sending them off to Betsy and then, and then we're 
she's sending them back to me and to be able to record the slides and me at the same time. So I'm not going to actually put the text up on the screen uh, here. I'm going to just read the text to you from my own Bible right here, and then you guys can follow along. Hopefully you have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. After the uproar ceased, and that's from that riot for Artemis, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews, as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. So Peter, the Berean, son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him, and the, Thess and the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy, and the Asians, Ty Tychus and Trophimus. These went on ahead and were waiting for him at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with him, intending to depart on the next day, and he, pro he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where, he, where we were gathered, and a young, man, a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down on the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him, and taking him in his arms, said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, and eaten he conversed with them a long while until daybreak, and so departed. And they took the youth away alive, and were not a little comforted. But going on ahead to the ship, we set sail for Assos, uh, intending to take Paul abroad there, and so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he, and when he met us at Assos, we took him aboard and went to Mighty Lane or Midi Lane. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite of Chios. The next day we touched Samos, and the day after we went to Miletus, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. So we got a little um, story here about the travels of, of Paul, and it's kind of sandwiched here um, as well as a story as to what's going on as far as um, his stay in Troas. There's a little story there that kind of highlights uh, what we should think about what What's this main section really about? And really, it's, again, stressing the power of the gospel, the power of the work of Christ in all of this. And so the big idea here is the threat of death is neutered by the power of God displayed in the work of Christ. Okay, so Paul has this threat as he's in Greece, uh, this threat by the Jews. And then right after this, after he finds out about the threat, goes somewhere else, uh, he then encounters um, this young man. Eutychus, who dies, and then Paul resuscitates him, showing again this power that God uses through the Apostle Paul and through his gospel, that death is, is neutered. So the threat of death is, death is neutered by the power of God displayed in the work of Christ. That is a theme throughout the New Testament, especially here in the book of Acts. So, what do we have going on here? First we have Paul leaving, Paul leaving Ephesus. As we said, we'd already seen in the prior chapter here that Paul had set in plan uh, or in motion his plan to leave Ephesus right before this riot occurred. The riot is not what drove him from Ephesus. Really, his time had just come. He'd been there for about uh, three years, and he's ready to move on. Uh, in Acts 19, verses 21 through 22, if you flip over there, uh, Paul had expressed his desire to go to Jerusalem. Right? He's ready to go to Jerusalem. We don't really have a firm reason why he feels uh, this need to go to Jerusalem. There's a few other things we can piece together from his epistles uh, that we'll talk about. But he seems to know about the suffering that awaits him in Jerusalem. And he wants to go there and confront that suffering. And he also wants to bring uh, the funds that he had raised by from other churches in the area uh, to bring those to those who are suffering in Judea. So 
once this is all figured out, he leaves, he goes through Macedonia, encouraging the churches there, Berea, Thessalonica, and Philippi, and then he heads to Greece. Uh, most likely he spends, it says he spends three months there, uh, most likely the majority of that time is spent in Corinth. So Paul wrote his letters to Corinth when he was in Ephesus. So here he's now going to check up on them. And remember when we went through First and Second Corinthians, there were Almost certainly more letters than those two, and probably at least two more, four total letters uh, from Paul while in Ephesus to the church in Corinth to deal with their problems. So he spends some time uh, there, three months, dealing with the issues, uh, equipping the leaders to deal with what's going on and all the problems uh, in that church. And that while he's there, the second half of verse 3, we read, Well, there's a plot made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail. For Syria. Now, of course, Syria is where Jerusalem and Antioch uh, are located. So he wants to go to Jerusalem uh, from Corinth, but he's going to be prevented because of the plot of the Jews. He's eventually going to go back uh, at least a little bit by land and go in a roundabout way. So he got this, he's got this threat from the Jews. Um, so he is now going to set up by foot through Macedonia again. So here again, Paul faces the threat of death from his opponents. It really doesn't phase him. He doesn't just say, yeah, go ahead and kill me. He takes some logical steps to make sure that he's not killed, uh, but he's not hes not living in fear. All right? he, he realizes, I think he's realized for quite some time, uh, that his service to God in preaching the gospel is going to cost him his life. He knows that, and he's okay with that. He's made peace with that reality because he does believe in the resurrection. So then we get a long list here of the traveling companions of Paul. Okay, so we got this list, and not just names, but also uh, locations, or what towns or churches that these individuals represent. And we also notice here that in this section, uh, Luke, as he's writing, starts using the term us again. So Luke has joined up again uh, with Paul at this time as he's traveling around. So you have individuals. Uh, from Philippi, you have individuals uh, from from these different churches who are accompanying Paul. And this is, again, most likely because of the money involved. Paul has collected these funds to support those suffering in Judea and Jerusalem in the church. And as he said in his letter to the Corinthians that he's coming there to pick that up. That's probably one of the reasons he went there for the three months. He's picking that up from there and the other churches, and they're sending with them representatives. Because Paul, if you can remember from First and Second Corinthians, he's been accused of some financial um, underhanded tactics. So we have representatives from these different churches to ensure that these, Paul wants to be above reproach, that these funds are going to reach where they're going to, where Paul said they're going to go. It's not for him. He doesn't need the money. He renounces uh, that kind of money. And instead, he is going uh, to bring those to the churches in uh, Judea and Jerusalem. So then we have here in verse 7 this idea of them uh, worshiping together as we as we transition here. On the first day of the week, they've arrived in Troas now. Uh, they gathered together to break bread, and Paul talked with them, intending on departing the next day, so he prolonged his speech until midnight. There's a lot of interesting facts here. All right, so in Troas here, we get a, a glimpse into some early worship services of the church. And right now we're in a pause and a break of our worship services, but we can see that these worship services, um, really the church is the word congregation. Uh, it's a gathering. It's a physical assembly of individuals. The church is not something that can be replaced by online broadcasts or multi-site campuses and beaming in pastors who aren't there, who don't know their flock. That's never been the vision of the New Testament church. It is a local a gathering of Christians who have covenanted together, who have gathered together under the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who know each other, who love each other, who support one another and encourage one another uh, by being physically together as much as possible. As we've talked about, uh, we can leverage technology uh, to help when we can't gather together. That's what we're doing here. That's what we're doing with our streaming services, but that can't ever really replace uh, physically being together. Uh, we see that Anybody who's ever had a loved one who served in the army or who had to be uh, separated overseas or traveling knows that uh, technology can mitigate the distance. That's why Paul writes his letters, but it can't actually replace being with a loved one. Uh, but as we get a glimpse into this early uh, worship service, we see that they gather on the first day of the week. 
Now, this is a major change because uh, the Jewish custom would be the last day of the week, the Sabbath, to worship on. But the church from very early on is worshiping together on that first day of the week. And the reason for that is that is the day Christ rose from the dead. Uh, that is the day that um, the new covenant was ushered in through the work of Christ. And the first day of the week represents the new creation. The creation week has been fulfilled, and we've now moved into the new creation, as it were. So the church has, from the inception, really met on that first day of the week. And we continue to meet on Sundays uh, to praise and remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So uh, as, as they're worshiping together, we see a few other things. They break bread together which is a reference to communion. Uh, it's almost certain that the early church almost certainly worshipped uh, or had communion every week. Uh, we do it the first of every month. I don't think it's a hard and fast command that the church has to uh, have communion every single week, uh, but it does seem that the early church did do that. And also a part of this, we see that there's a sermon given. There's teaching. Central to the worship service is the teaching of God's Word. So, uh, it's it's almost it's almost certain that the church did not gather on Sunday morning. They probably gathered on Sunday evening after the workday, as it were. They gathered together uh, to worship God together. And uh, Paul, after the as a part of the breaking of bread and the observance of communion, they would have a feast, a community meal, and then they would have the Lord's Supper as a part of that, and then they would teach. Uh, Paul would teach, and so from evening, from supper time, it says then until midnight, Paul taught. So when you think about um, Pastor Joel or me or Richard, we preach or teach from anywhere from 30 to 40 minutes. And sometimes when we get up to 40 minutes, that can feel kind of long. Paul taught for hours. And even if you go back a couple hundred years uh, in Protestant tradition, they would teach for hours. And then they would come back on Sunday evening and they would teach again for hours. So our sermons of 40 minutes or so may feel long in today's fast-paced, hectic culture. But historically speaking, they're incredibly short. They're incredibly short. If a 40-minute sermon can't sustain you uh, throughout the week, uh, you have to put in more. So that's why we have things like Sunday school and mid midweek uh, lessons and hopefully reading your Bible and whatnot. But you see these core elements of the worship service, uh, physically gathering together the first day of the week, um, the fellowship of communion, and the teaching of God's Word. Now, as Paul is teaching... And it's getting late as he's teaching until midnight. Eutychus, who's described as a young man, uh, probably from ages somewhere from the age of 8 to 14, is struggling to stay awake. He moves over to the window, and in the process, he falls down uh, to his death from three stories down. He's fighting that sleep. Um, that's sometimes some of us do sitting in those pews. But he's sitting on a window, and he falls out uh, to his death. Now, the irony is, is Eutychus, the name means lucky. Like he, his name means he's a lucky guy. He doesn't appear too lucky here. But he falls to his death in the middle of Paul's uh, preaching and teaching. But Paul then goes down there. So you should notice here that the text makes it plain. Paul says, or Luke, the doctor is there with him, says he was taken up dead. All right, so this isn't somebody who's just knocked unconscious or conscious. He is dead. And uh, Paul then goes down there and he throws himself upon the young man. And in doing so, he says, no, 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 life is still in him. Now, that doesn't mean that he wasn't dead. It means that by Paul doing this, a miracle has happened, and he has been risen from the dead. In fact, what Paul does is reminiscent of what both Elijah and Elisha uh, do with a couple of the resurrections uh, in their time. Elijah with the boy, the young man of the widow, embraces him as he's dead. And also Elisha, the son of the Shunamite, Shunamite woman, does the same thing. And it resurrects them. Paul's doing that here. And through that, the power of the gospel is then displayed. And the people are encouraged because death has been overcome. So you got this, you got this um, parallel thing going on here. Paul is threatened with his life uh, by the Jews. But through God, death is not a threat. It's been neutered. And we really do uh, need to hear that today. We can be so consumed with not getting sick and not possibly dying with, again, even if you were to get sick, unless you're a really high-risk person, you're probably not going to die from it. And yet we can, be we can be anxious and driven by fear, but Christians should never be driven by fear of death. Yes, we don't want to die. We don't want to be irresponsible or any of those things like that. But we don't 
let that fear cause us to do things that are unchristian, to cause us to not love other people, not care for them, not look them in the eye when they walk by or when they come by, we got to get as far away from that unknown person. Um, no, that's not, that's not the Christian way uh, to behave. Right? Death is neutered by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then at the end of this section, we read about Paul's uh, desire. All right, they set sail again. Uh, Paul doesn't want to go to Ephesus because he wants to get to Jerusalem, and he knows if he gets his foot in the door at Ephesus again, uh, he's not going to get out quickly. So he sails um, and sets up in Miletus, which is about 30 miles uh, outside of Ephesus. It's a roundabout road, so the actual road would be longer than 30 miles, but as the crow flies, it's 30 miles, and he sets up the camp there, and he wants to talk with the leaders of the Ephesian church. Uh, but uh, he has this desire to be in Jerusalem by Pentecost. That is the goal he is working towards. But he has this desire here to be in Jerusalem. And something we need to note here, that in Luke's Gospel and then Acts here, there's a lot of parallels from here on out uh, of, Luke, or of Paul setting his face towards Jerusalem and when Jesus did that for Holy Week. Now, of course, Paul is not Jesus, but he is following in the footsteps of his Savior. And there's going to be a lot of parallels between Jesus and Paul as they both know what awaits them in Jerusalem. So both of them traveled, both Jesus and Paul traveled with disciples on the way uh, to Jerusalem. That's one parallel we see. Both are opposed by hostile Jews who are plotting against them. All right, so here's another parallel. Both received three warnings, both in Luke's Gospel and then here in Acts. Three warnings about what awaits them in Jerusalem. Uh, both express a desire to be or to lay down their lives uh, for their mission and their ministry's sake. Both are handed over to the Gentiles once they get into Jerusalem and arrested. Uh, both are de determined to complete their ministry no matter the cost. And both ultimately express a desire to trust God's will uh, for their lives instead of uh, escaping wrath and punishment. So Paul's desire for, for Jerusalem mirrors Christ's resolve to go there no matter the personal cost. And that will get us here um, to this last section here as Paul is going to instruct the leaders of Ephesus in the last section of verses 17 uh, through 38 here. Verses 17 uh, through 38, Paul is going to, uh, yeah, Paul is going to teach the pastors of, of uh, Ephesus. Let's read that. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you are, are none of you among whom I have gone out about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one with tears. And now I commend to you God, or to commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which He is able to build you or build up and to give you the inheritance among all those 
who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because the word he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And he accompanied them, or they accompanied him to the ship. So our big idea here, as Paul gives this uh, sermon here, or speech to pastors, that pastors are charged with caring for, teaching, and protecting the flock which God himself purchased with his own blood. So this is the only speech we have in the book of Acts where Paul addresses pastors at a, at a length. And it really does give us an insight of what it means to do ministry and why we do ministry and how we should do ministry. So let's dive into it here. So Paul instructs pastors. Paul calls for the elders of the Ephesian church here in verse 17. We already covered this. Amylatus is about 30 miles away. So he calls for them to come to him so he doesn't have to go to Ephesus so that he can give them his final instructions because he does not anticipate seeing them again. And we can break down, uh, we can break down Paul's uh, sermon here or his speech into three parts. And the first part is Paul talks about his ministry. He's going to talk to of the leaders in Ephesus of what they have seen him do, right? Because there are accusations going around about Paul that are not true. We have a lengthy list of those accusations in first and second Corinthians. And we have some of them in his, his letter to the Galatians as well. So he wants them to remember what they've seen him do as he's ministered to them. So he calls them. He says, you have seen my humility, really his humiliation as he's been persecuted and they've seen him endure trials. Right? They've seen the slander Paul endures. They've seen the lies that come upon him. They know and they have seen firsthand his humility in that and how he has been steadfast in these trials. That he has been faithful even and especially when it is costly. And that is something that the pastors should learn from. Second, they've seen his boldness. All right, so his boldness, that despite threats to his life, despite threats to him possibly dying in his reputation, Paul's ministry has been marked with boldness. They had to restrain him from going out and facing the mob. Right, So this is a man who knows the cost, the personal cost of ministry, and yet he does not care. He will do whatever it takes that the gospel might be preached and that the church might be strengthened. Likewise, the pastors, pastors should learn from the boldness of, of Paul, that he declared these things despite great opposition. And he did this by teaching both in public and in private. Right? He declared this in the synagogues. He declared uh, the gospel in a public town hall and also from house to house. Right? So his ministry is both declaring things in public and in private. And he did this both for Jews and to Gentiles. Right? He has no discrimination as to who he will preach the gospel to. He'll preach it to whoever uh, will listen. And finally, and they've seen his ministry as the content of his ministry is preaching repentance and faith. Let's look at that a little closer, closer there. Uh, verse 21, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That faithful ministry means we have to confront sin, instruct individuals to turn from that sin, and to turn from it toward Jesus Christ in faith. If we do not preach repentance and faith together, then we are not preaching the gospel that has been handed down to us from Christ and from the apostles. The second part of Paul's uh, ministry here, or his sermon here, is his coming suffering. So he says, you've seen what I've done. Here's what awaits me. All right, so now we've looked backward. Now we're going to look forward. He says, the Spirit has prepared me that in every town I go into, I know the afflictions that await me. I know the imprisonment. I know the beatings. Uh, I know that as I prepare to go to Jerusalem, that is probably going to end up costing me my life. The Spirit has prepared me. He's encouraged me. He's strengthened me to, the, to this end. And I do not fear these things. My boldness remains. And I am willing to give up my life in service to the gospel ministry. Again, we've talked about this with this 
pandemic and virus, that that should be something that marks us. If the Lord calls us home because of some virus and because of our faithfulness in the face of this virus, so be it. So be it. The gospel overcomes, yes, even death by virus, by corona or whatever it might be. He desires then also, thirdly, to finish his mission. When Paul call, or when God called him through Christ appearing on the way uh, or the road to Damascus, he set him on this path. He's been on this mission, planting churches, suffering for the sake of the gospel, and he wants to follow in the footsteps of his Savior uh, to Jerusalem, even and especially when it will cost him his life. And then he tells them quite plainly that they will not see him again. And this is what really gets to the leaders of Ephesus as he spent three years there, uh, that they will never probably see Paul again. He's very fond of them. They are very fond of him. And he knows that as he departs from Ephesus, he will never set foot in that town yet again. And he wants them to remember, though, that he has been faithful. That he is not guilty of any of their blood. He has declared everything. He's taught the whole counsel of God to them. They are equipped and they are ready as the leaders of that local church uh, to do as he has commanded them. And the third and final section is instructions uh, to pastors. So we talked about this, I don't know, maybe a month, month and a half ago uh, when we when we read that Paul plants elders or appoints elders at every church that he plants. Uh, elder here is, uh, is used uh, interchangeably in the New Testament between elder overseer, which we sometimes translate as bishop. Elder, overseer, bishop, slash bishop, or pastor is all used in this passage. All right, so the elders are called to him. They're told that they are the overseers who shepherd uh, the flock. Shepherd is just another word for pastor here. So he instructs them, first and foremost, in verse 28. Uh, let me read that. Pay careful attention, uh, you yourselves, to the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers of the church of God, which he obtained uh, by his own blood. That should give us great pause. So, all right, so you should shepherd the sheep, shepherd the flock, care for the flock. That's that's what the, the term there means. Shepherd the flock. Oversee them, which means to lead them, to manage them, because God himself has bought that flock with his own blood. All right, so we got declarations of the divinity of Christ here, right? How is God's blood bought? It Because Jesus is, is God. But you also have here that the church is of great value to God because he bought the church himself with his own blood. So shepherd the sheep, O oh pastors. Tend them, care for them, because God bought them. They are his, not yours. Uh, along those lines, we are also then instructed as pastors to defend the sheep. This is why I know that after my departure... Fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. For among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. One of the main jobs of a pastor is to defend the sheep from the wolves. And Jesus had warned us of that, that in the last days there will be more wolves. There will be wolves in sheep's clothing. There will be false teachers who will come in and who will deceive us and tell us lies. They don't even necessarily have to come into the church. And the world is full of these wolves devouring people and saying what they're doing is good. One of the main things we do as pastors, and Pastor Joel, myself, and Richard, we do this all the time and intentionally so. You may feel like we're being negative sometimes. But God has bought you with his own blood. And one of the things we must do is when we know people are lying to you and they're deceiving you, I must, before my Lord God, tell you that you are being lied to. I must defend you for your soul has been purchased by the blood of our Savior. And I am accountable before him to defend you against those law, lies. And that is my job is to look at wolves and to beat them off with a big stick, as it were. One of the ways we do that is then, as he says, is admonishing or correcting those ones, even with tears. He has spent day and night uh, admonishing people with tears tears. He did not cease doing that. And the role of the pastor is to teach and correct the flock as they buy into those lies, as they are coming out of the lies that they grew up in, that it is our job is to look you in the eye and to tell you hard things. And sometimes that means we will be crying and we will be emotionally involved with that when we say, hey, this is not easy for me to tell you, but what you're doing is wrong. 
and you need to stop doing it. That is one of the roles of a shepherd, a pastor, elder, overseer. And we do this uh, by relying on God's grace uh, and his word. Therefore, be alert, remembering, all right, sorry, verse 32, and now I commend to you God, or commend you to God, and to the word of his grace that is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So he says, I commend you to God and to his word of grace, that in the word of God is given the grace so that you can receive the inheritance that Christ has purchased. Right, so it's not just a one-time repentant believe you do that, but you are then to grow into that inheritance that has been purchased on your behalf by grace through faith. You are to grow into maturity in the faith. And you do that through the word. So pastors, preachers, our teaching is primarily found in the word of God. Now that can be theological teaching, it can be systematic teaching, it can be exegetical word or verse by verse, word by word, which we're doing right now. But it is our job to teach you these things so that you might grow up into that inheritance that has been secured for you. And then Paul kind of wraps this section up by talking about how he has renounced greed. He has not profited. He's not become wealthy off of his ministry. Instead, he has worked hard to provide for himself so that no one can accuse him of being greedy. And this is something us pastors need to remember. I did not become a pastor to become rich. If I wanted to become wealthy, I would have chosen a different profession. But as a pastor, I do need, we do have needs, we do have income needs, and it's not wrong for pastors to collect on those things, but we do not try to become wealthy. If pastors make their ministry, and there are famous pastors out there who have become wealthy off of telling people to give to their ministries, they are wolves. They are not following the example of the apostles, and they are not uh, following uh, the heart of a shepherd. And then finally, to combat that in yourselves, you should be giving of yourself to others. So that's the that's the totality, really, of Paul's sermon uh, to the pastors. And then he departs from there, verses 36 through 38. He said these things, he left, the people are struck. They are weeping because uh, the one who has equipped them, the one who has taught them, the one they love and who loves them is now leaving and they will never see him again. We'll do a little bit, a quick a recounting of this uh, theology and practice on pastoring here. Pastoring. <clears throat> From here we can see four main things of what it what a job what job a pastor is supposed to do. Number one, pastors, elders. We should also talk about this. Um, you'll notice that Paul called elders to him or pastors to him. That every church should have um, multiple pastors over it. Uh, that doesn't mean all the pastors have to be paid full-time staff, but there should be multiple pastors because the church is not, a local church is not run in a CEO top-down model. The, there is wisdom uh, in, in unity and blessing in having multiple minds coming together in leading the congregation. We all have strengths, we all have weaknesses, and we complement one another. Putting all of our bags into one basket is not the biblical model of pastoring. Uh, for example, we don't technically have an elder board here at church, though you do have three pastors, really four counting Harold. We have four pastors who come together and make a lot of these decisions, but we don't make all of the decisions because we also then have the church council, which kind of it does take some of the elder roles um, that probably should be reserved uh, for elders, but they act as a representative of the congregation, which is good. Baptists are congregationally ruled as well, but uh, there is there is wisdom in multiple voices. There is wisdom in not having a top-down approach. So Paul calls elders to himself over the church at Ephesus, and we see these four things that, that elders do. We lead the flock. One of the things pastors do is we set the direction. We weigh in on the decisions on the future of the church because that is what it means to shepherd a flock, is to lead them to greener pastures, to lead them in spiritual maturity, to lead them in these things. And one of the main ways we lead the church, right, not as, not as dictators, but we do it by teaching, by declaring to you what does the word of God say? What does it demand of us? Applying it to our situation as a local congregation. We are to teach the word in a, with authority. Now, uh, you should always be checking our authority with the, your Bibles open. When we get things wrong, listen to the Bible and not us. And third, 
we are to care for the flock. All right, so leading the flock, teaching the flock, and then also thirdly, uh, caring for the flock, meeting the needs of the flock. And this is where deacons come in, the other office of the church. The deacons help the elders, pastors, meet the needs of the congregation. Uh, we can meet lots of needs as three uh, three or four pastors here, but we can't meet all of them. That's why we have deacons. And even underneath that, uh, as you as if you're not a deacon, as you see needs that you can meet, you should also be bearing one another's um, burdens and caring uh, for one another. But the pastors are to be an example uh, to that end and to lead in caring for the flock as a whole. And then finally, as we talked about, defend the flock. That is a major role as we live in a fallen, broken world, as we live in these, these last days in between Christ's resurrection and his ascension and his second coming, that Satan is a roaring lion seeking those he might devour. He's the dragon in Revelation 12 seeking to oppress God's people, that there are false teachers who arise within the church, that it is our job uh, to stand with our sta stand with a rod in hand and to beat off the wolves. It is our job to tell you where the dangers are, where your dangers are, where your sin temptations are, so that we might defend you so that you will obtain the inherit inheritance uh, that Christ has purchased for you. And so that's uh, that's what we see here about what it means to be a pastor. Those are really the four main roles of what it means to be a pastor. Some of us are more gifted in one of those four roles than the others. Uh, but the, that's what it means as a team of pastors. That's what we should be should be doing, and that's what you should be looking for uh, from your pastors today and any new pastors you may encounter in the various changes of life. So that uh, that concludes Acts chapter 20 and our study of that. Uh, next week we'll post something on Acts chapter 21, uh, and that will be for Easter Sunday, as it were. And then hopefully after that, um, hopefully we'll be gathering together again sometime in the near future. Miss you guys. I hopefully will see you soon.